They sent the DA after me. All the agencies, federal agencies were after me now. The DA came in, they, they checked all my books, and they didn't find a single opiate prescription anywhere. So they left with the dry well. They didn't find anything to accuse me of. Uh, the, the woman who came in from uh, the DEA said, never seen an addiction practice with no narcotics. <laughs> <laughs> so she spent three weeks in my office, you know, watching our every move, looking at records, and she left. <laughs> As the opioid epidemic rages across America, we all know that there are many forces at work corrupting Americans, doing our best to take care of each other and treat addiction in all its forms. Do you think it's possible that there are better forms of addiction treatment out there than what the mainstream is putting forth today? That maybe drugs, methadone, and systems of command and control aren't the best way to support people dealing with addiction? Is it possible that alternatives have been discovered years ago and been kept from you? Well, today I'm talking with Dr. Kishora here and what he has done in the field of addiction medicine is revolutionary. And, 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 and I hate to say it like this, but really is, is, a, is a revolution in, in thinking about addiction and, and what you have done and how you have changed the paradigm and what you have shown is possible. And yet it's a revolution that has really not realized its potential because of how it has been suppressed. And we're going to get the whole story from the doctor here, but I just want to point out one more thing before we get into that, that if you are dealing with addiction, if someone in your life is dealing with addiction, just know that there are people out there, there are systems out there, there are institutions out there, there is support and you don't have to struggle alone. But I think Dr. Kishore could say all this far better than anything I could say about addiction. So I, I'd like to just start by giving you a chance to, to tell us about your background first. Where are you from and, and why did you get into medicine in the first place? Thank you, Adam. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be with you today. Um, <clears throat> I come from a family of physicians. My mother, father, brother, sister, my uncle, science, many of them are physicians in India. We are uh, rooted in uh, their me medicine uh, and care of people. So I went into medicine as part of the family tradition and uh, uh, I had a great time being a doctor and practicing medicine across the different continents. Um, <clears throat> I came to this country in 1977 and uh, I started working at a program called the Washingtonian Hospital in Boston. That was the oldest addiction program in the country, uh, dating back to the Martha Washington and uh, 18, early 1800s. Benjamin Rush, they founded the whole concept of taking care of addicts through um, a different methodology than punishing them. So it was the last addiction program of the whole chain of hospitals that was still persisting when I came to the country. I began to work there, I became a medical director there, and had a great time seeing all the ancient uh, tomes there and reading all the original uh, thinkers and their, how their minds worked in the uh, uh, early <clears throat> days of independence of the country and what they created here. So that's how I started. I'm, I'm, I've got so many jokes about people in Beantown have getting, been getting messed up since before this place was a country, right? Uh, but the, it's, it's really interesting to see that this, this goes back so far, that addiction is really something that's like inherent to human nature, right? Oh, absolutely. It's, uh, it's somewhat like gravity, you know, you cannot uh, see it, but it is there. Addiction is always there in some form or fashion, either it be to chemicals, either it be to behaviors, to processes like gambling, internet, or to obsessive compulsive thoughts, it's innate uh, to human beings. And so nobody is immune to addiction. Addiction is not a, a good word in some ways because it does not uh, really describe it, but it is innate to every human being, this, uh, this kind of an addictive personality. You say like the tendency to repetitive behaviors that are not in our best interest because of a short-term payoff or some kind of bad temptation, right? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, when I study the subhuman species, we see that happening in Indian elephants, you know, they get drunk and uh, <laughs> roll around. 
Uh, no, really, if you if you don't know about <laughs> drunken Indian elephants, like there's some hilarious stories out there. Yeah, yeah go look it up. So I think you know it is it is a force of nature. It's part of the human uh, makeup, and um, it surfaces from time to time in in the ten percent of the people. Other people can take a take take a drink and put it down, but in five to ten percent of the people, it becomes an obsession, a compulsion, and an addiction. And the, the if I know how to identify these five ten percent of people, I'll get the Nobel Prize. But right <laughs> now, we don't have a system of uh, Diagnosing them, so we got to work with what we have. Um, there well, well, let me step back. What, what were the other specialties of the, of the members of your family, and are, and are you the first with with addiction? And, and and what what really like keeps you in? Is there some personal experience or not really? I'm a scientist by at heart, and uh, it's, it's a virgin field in the sense nobody has really studied it to any depth. Uh, I'm a thinker at root. In, um, to be a good addiction doctor, you must know primary care, a liberal psychiatry, psychology, social work, anthropology, uh, sociology, public health, law, so on and so forth. You need about 19 disciplines. I'm, 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 I'm a thinker and a reader of all the different uh, areas of... Uh, so it made it uh, intriguing for me to follow this uh, chase. Now, before you had the initiative and the freedom and then and the, the opportunity to create your own method and your own business and all those other ways here in, here in Massachusetts, you worked in a prison system for how many years? Oh, uh, for 13 years I was the associate medical director for the Massachusetts Department of Correction and uh, we had control on quite a few prisons and um, some, some of them outside the state too. Uh, we started the prison health care or correctional health systems um, and we got good reviews for what we did. So this is all working with inmates. I mean, this is, this is like heavy. This is, this is about as right. intense as it gets for addiction treatment, right? Right, and um, we worked with uh, people who are criminally insane, people who are uh, severely addicted, stage four, stage five addicts. We worked with uh, people who are um, behaviorally challenged and uh, incarcerated for uh, Various, various behaviors. So the whole gamut uh, was my bailiwick. There's like huge credentials. I mean, it's a, just, just to be clear, like before, before Dr. Kishore did anything like stepping out on his own, he was a company man for a long time, learning the heart, I mean, like working in jail. Mm -hmm. And we'll come to the part about him going to jail later. But I mean, I, I, I've done a few months myself, as, as you might know. Um, the doctor ended up doing over eight months. And it's just really kind of ironic that you go from serving people in jail to, to being in jail. But the, w what did you learn during that time? Like, what did you see in, in the system when you were working for the jail, the, working for the government, providing their program for inmates? What I found is uh, um, the the holes in the medical system. Um, when I did an analysis of uh, people who went into Bridgewater State Hospital for the criminally insane, uh, quite a few of them, 25% had uh, subtle neurological damage. It could be seizure disorders, head injuries, lead poisoning. All of these were undiagnosed, underdiagnosed by their pediatricians and primary care doctors. And the subtle abnormality set them off pretty quickly and they behaved in an uh, aberrant way and then got hauled off to the Bridgewater State Hospital where they were, uh, you know, we found out some of these things by trial and error, what's going on with them. I found many of the people are there uh, for quasi-medical reasons and um, the behavior and the, the body, soma and the psyche are all one. Uh, people might act in uh, aberrant ways but the roots might be lying in the brain physiology. At the time, the EEGs and varieties of techniques were coming out. We, we had the chance to really go in-depth into understanding the, the medical aspects of criminal behavior. But that's a whole other cutting edge field, the medical aspects of criminal behavior. But obviously addiction is going to be a significant problem in jail. And I don't have to point out how ridiculous it is for the government to try to 
enforce drug prohibition in the general population when they can't even keep drugs out of prisons. And I'm sure you saw plenty of that in addition to this ridiculous frustration, right, when you're in that program. So you ended up creating your own program based on all this experience. And I guess I'd like to ask you to start with rather than just explain the program, and I want to take the time for this because this is really important for people to understand as what the, so I'll, I, I, I hate to even use that word, call this, this is the alternative treatment, as if it's like, no, this is, this is the honest treatment compared to the dishonest treatment that they, they, where they want to keep you as a patient, where they want to keep you addicted, and they want to keep the money flowing. They, they want to keep the cure rates low, right. so they keep the treatment rates and high and keep the patient numbers up. So what was the first initiative in the, in the start of this process to, to, to really set off on your own? You know, Adam, as you correctly said, I was a company guy. You know, I worked inside the system. I went with the flow. I ran the programs from 77 to 89. <clears throat> I know I was, I learned the system. But in 89, um, I broke with the system in the sense that um, I didn't feel people needed a, a detox in, in, the, in the hospital. Uh, in the addiction care system, detox is the costliest part of the, um, part of the fare. They have to pay anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars to get the detox done. Well, hold on a second. Yeah. I, I got, you got to unpack that for me a little bit because I've never heard about this. The you, you, detox is in like we're going to sit you in a room and make sure that you don't do drugs. I mean, aside from like major withdrawal, is it withdrawal treatments? Is it like people people going through like heroin, right. physiological alcoholism, where their bodies that they they need that's why it's expensive. The withdrawal treatment is not well understood, uh, so. The regular system uh, put the people away, out of sight, out of mind, go to mountaintop or go to a faraway place like uh, Berry Ford Center, and you chill out for uh, 28 days and you come back sober and live a life. And the withdrawal sim symptoms are the main drivers for this uh, um, <clears throat> abandonment or uh, forcing them to go far away. They didn't want to treat it locally. Um, and I realized, you know, this is something that can be done in my sleep. It's, it's resetting physiology. When a person withdraws, five different things happen to the human body. Number one, they start throwing up and have, you know, loose bowel movements or uh, at the same time. This is normal part of uh, human biology to expel all the poisons. And to, do, to control that, all that they need is a shot of Zofran or medicine that we always give for cancer, chemotherapy or whatever. Same thing will help the addict. The second thing that happens is, you know, they become very stiff. Their body contracts to the nth degree, very painful. It's somewhat like tetanic, when you have tetanus, people have locked jaw, and it's a similar situation. You know, I'm sorry to interrupt on this. Before you go any further, though, you're, it sounds like you're talking exclusively about heroin and opiate withdrawal. Is that right? They're all shades of the same. Uh, alcohol, all the withdrawal symptoms happen with the d drugs that depress the brain. Alcohol depresses the brain, uh, opiates depress the brain. But they all have the same cascade, but in different, different avatars, different uh, degrees. So when a person is coming off of uh, alcohol, they also throw up. Uh, they also will have uh, seizures. Um, they'll have uh, hallucinations. And they'll have DTs. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing happens with opiates also, except for a more prolonged period of time. Uh, and then, and then same same thing happens with other benzodiazepines. It's a matter of degrees. You know, if the drug stays in your system longer, the withdrawal is longer. If the drug is water soluble and it gets excreted out faster, it's shorter. So the withdrawal syndrome in general is anywhere from a week to ten days and uh, for the most of the drugs. And so for that, to treat that, they pay an arm and a leg to get into the detox centers, which are far away. And there they are treated not so well. Um, they say, don't be, um, you know, hypochondriac, don't uh, just tough it out. It's a tough love, but on a mountain top, they can't escape. So this is the cruelty that, that goes into the addiction treatment. But as I realized, you can treat them very humanely in their own home, with their own family, or in my office, by giving them a few medicines. 
something for nausea and vomiting, something for the muscle cramps, something for the sleep, something for the blood pressure fluctuations, and something to restore their vitamins and nutrients. So with five medicines, I was able to do withdrawal management in a week or 10 days. It's a daily watch, and people were getting better. The cost is like five, six visits, and it's about $500 at the most if they can't pay, uh, if they can't afford the insurance. So we were able to do the withdrawal uh, in a very short period of time. That's what I started doing in 89. I started a program called the Home Free. You are at home, but you're free of the withdrawal. And that was very popular in the communities. Now, hold on, I gotta go back for a sec, because you kind of glossed over mm -hmm. like the, or, the, or one of the real key critical distinctions between what you've developed and everything else. Right. And I mean, as a libertarian, as a fan of freedom and voluntarism and decentralization and individual empowerment, it's like, wow, yeah, duh. And it's like, yeah, freedom works yeah. in this and that there's, so what, but what you said, I, I really want you to, to, to make sure that our viewers understand what you are getting at when you're saying that the, the old models are about controlling the patient. Right. Tough love, mm -hmm. you're gonna tough it out. Mm -hmm. you, 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 can't, you can't relapse, there's a, it's, you're, you're in a force controlled environment. And yet those programs have a success rate of, and, and, and I know this is a little cyber, but give me the success rate comparison numbers, please. Well, from what the data I have seen, it's about a 2 to 5 percent uh, success rate at one year, using the benchmark of success being continuous unbroken sobriety. And uh, that's kind of very low returns for the investment. And this is where people are... Well, and, and your program was... So, so you're saying that the standard mainstream program, like even today what we have in the country, an addiction treatment program, if it has a success rate around 2 to 5%, that's considered like, okay, acceptable, that's, that's the norm? That's the norm, and uh, they take it for granted. That's, the, that's, that's what they you can do. You can't treat addiction. You can't, you can't really... You just, that, that, that's insane. And, and, and if you just stop and think about it, and anybody who understands anything about corruption of the medical industry goes, this is the most obvious example of keep people sick. And it's easy. They're already addicts. They, they, are, they, they have addiction prone personalities. It's, it's like this, it's of course, you, it's gonna be easy. All you have to do is not cure them and they're gonna continuously need more treatment. Right. And what, what you were able to do was I, I mean, I think it's best summed up as like a community-based approach where you're giving them the support without the control right. and this, the, the, without, without the, the, the punishment mentality, without the you're wrong or you're bad, but we just, if you have a problem with addiction, we want to help you with this, here's the support, and we're not going to try to control you. If you want to do drugs, you're, gonna you're at home, you're going to, and, and just, I, 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 I love this idea, like just to see, oh yeah, freedom works yeah. everywhere, you know, even in something as, you know, fundamental as, as addiction treatment that, that, that we sort of take for granted as like, oh no, you got to keep the people away from the drugs. If you want to stop using the drugs, you got to use force and control and, and, you know, more drugs and methadone. And it's like, can, can, can you elaborate just on, on that point specifically, the difference in your program being freedom-based, patient-centered, community-based, the outpatient model, as opposed to the, the, the inpatient command control and, and, and medication model? Well, poor. I think they keep the threshold, the bar is very high. You need a lot of time and a lot of money. And uh, there's no guarantee of success. That's what they got to buy right now. Whereas in my practice, the threshold is very low. If they wanted help, they came in right away. It's voluntary. It's free. Freedom in the sense uh, that they can approach me. And we work with their symptoms. No two people are alike. Each person has their own different symptoms. So we prepared the medicines based on their uh, symptom uh, spectrum. And that made all the difference. Plus when they went home, they're going to an environment where all the cues are. In a 24 hour day, we're at home 16 hours and at work eight hours for the most part. So two thirds of the cues that trigger them back into addiction are at home. So when they are sober at home, it's like they, they, they beat the beast in their own, in its own um, 
you know, environment. Whereas if they go to a treatment center and they're clean in a treatment center and then suddenly they go home and they're surrounded by all the right. triggers that they've built into their life, yes. they're more inclined to relapse. Overwhelmed. Whereas in this case, the, each, each cues was getting extinguished you know, day by day. Um, and then we were giving them support in the office, the family is being educated. It made a whole lot of difference. In 89, I started the home free program. And 89 to 94, we went into the homes to see the home, home where they're living, what they're doing. It was very popular in the Cape Cod and um, some of the richer areas. And people were coming out of the woodwork wanting help. We saw some of the you know, most famous people in, uh, in the United States who have summer homes in, uh, in Martha's Vineyard and other places seeking help for home detox. That's when my eyes opened up. The system is wide wrong. So we need to de detox in the least expensive way. But then the problem came up uh, that when the people sober up, the, technically they are not medically ill anymore. So they were sent back to the community and the relapses are happening. To prevent that, we came up with a, a new method called sobriety maintenance. So we said, oh, for, okay, for three months, you have to be seen once or twice a week in my office for a urine test, hair test, or saliva test. So people began to come for the check-in, and that made a huge difference. A little surveillance, overt and covert surveillance we instituted right after the detox increased our statistics way out of proportion to our effort. People began to stay sober. Little check-in, a little check-in twice, thrice a month because the cravings come at particular times. You know, it could be on a Thursday when the pay, pay, they get the paycheck, that's when the triggers are. So we brought them into the office for a pizza party. <laughs> yeah, the ultimate trigger for addiction is having money in your pocket, right? <laughs> or we put their checks into the medical records, or we went to the bank and we deposited it into their account, plus we drew some money. So we, we, we helped them with the, the different aspects of the conducting their life. Like financial management is, is really connected to addiction, right? Absolutely, absolutely. and I think uh, the weekend, for example, is another trigger. Weekend when they go back to the families or loved ones, you know, a family life is a trigger. So we, we brought the families together on Saturday night. And then we, we, we analyzed the statistics. If people do relapse on a Saturday or a Sunday, the, the rate of suicide is very high on Monday. So we knew that from the British statistics and we began to cold call them on a Sunday night. How are you doing? What's happening? Or on a Monday morning. So we used all the scientific methods we can use to keep them sober for three to six months. Next thing you know, the numbers were going to the roof. People were staying sober for a long period of time. They were maintaining their sobriety. It became a chase. Just like they chased the drug, they began to chase their sober state. Hmm. It became a game in a way. And they loved it because they had other peers in the, in the groups where they're monitoring each other. Oh, you've been sober 11 months. Oh. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so it became a competitive juices began to flow and it really lifted all boards. Uh, little, little things we did. Uh, supporting them through their paychecks, to supporting them through the family weekends, to a little, uh, you know, cold calling and urine testing. This, this, this uh, nexus we call the sobriety maintenance phase. We, we expanded from three to six months to one full year because we began to realize people have um, triggers from different annual things, things. Annual yeah. things like uh, birthdays, death days, uh -huh. anniversaries. Yeah. So we, we said, okay, now we're going to expand it from three months to 13 months. We wanted one year of unbroken sobriety plus one month. So that became the program. People loved it because we were giving them continuous support and we were watching over them. We are not uh, you know, punitive. They're my patients, primary care patients. So we, we were very nice to them in many ways. And they had easy access to a doctor. That made a huge difference. So the 13 month program, 12 plus one program, uh, once they got the 12 months, you know, we cleared up all the wreckage of the past. We wrote letters to the IRS for forgiveness of uh, unpaid taxes. Mm. We, we had the power of the pen. As a doctor, we had the power of the pen. You know, that's, it's really powerful because I, I imagine yeah. if, if someone's dealing with addiction yeah. and, and a big part of it is dealing with stress, right. and it's just because they need a little help. Cause 
most government schools don't teach basic personal financial management skills or you know, they, they just they, just basic life organization stuff sure. and just being there for that community support so it's, I, I imagine that if if someone is driven to addiction by those kinds of life stresses mm -hmm. and then they go through a treatment program and they come out there great and it's not just coming home to triggers right. but it's like I still can't figure out how to get my life organized. If you don't give them that support, mm -hmm. that main pressure for addiction is there to, to trigger a relapse, right? You know, we've made everybody give them a copy of the one minute manager, how to manage your life in one minute. And uh, we sort of shepherded them. We had uh, students from uh, different schools who made them checklists, you know, budgets and whatever. We helped them get into the uh, different organizations for uh, financial support. So that they, they, money is important for them at this stage. And then we got their resumes uh, buffed up. Um, we call people in recovery, not uh, recovering addicts, we call them ambassadors. So they, when, when you saw, see the LinkedIn page that says ambassador for Dr. Kishore, that means they've been sober for a year. We gave them token jobs to get them back into the workforce to work in uh, small things like filing uh, you know, medical records or uh, organizing books, we give them small tasks and we paid them for that. I was speaking in front of a school children in uh, different high schools. So small things mattered a lot in the post uh, detox phase. And they didn't need a whole lot of counseling. I did the IQ studies on patients and so did other doctors. Most of them are highly intelligent people. They're not, you know, stupid. Uh, to conduct a uh, life, you know, they, they have IQs between 114 and 140. Is a Mensa class. So they're bright, bright people. They don't need counseling. They need guidance, education, teaching, training. This is what we realized. Uh, more than counseling is, you know, I'm here, you're here. Take, take the advice from me. We didn't do that. It's a collaborative. We only had round tables in all our, all our offices. So everybody sat around, put the problems on the table, and we all contributed to solving the problems. So we did not isolate the patient. They're part of the uh, community as a method, which is what I called it. Community as a method. We had a community of nurse practitioners, doctors. We all worked on the same patient, but patient is part of the process too. So they like the, the chance to be at the equal table with the doctors. So they can talk to us freely. We had no approbation for anything they said or did. They can express their views freely. This made a huge amount of difference. And you remove any threat of any kind of government or legal private consequences, private. yeah. And uh, we saw things that are untoward. We sort of guided them. There's a child at risk or whatever. We guided them rather than you know punish them by reporting them. And all of these small things help gain the trust, and then they follow through because we are delivering the goods. So once the year went by. <coughs> Then we wanted to enhance the sobriety experience. That's when we went full-time into job market. We realized three things kept my patients sober in my studies. If they had a job, they stayed sober longer. If they had a hobby, they stayed sober longer. If they had some sort of a connection to a spiritual or religious body, they stayed sober longer. So we began to work with uh, <coughs> jo uh, Mass Rehab Commission to get them into the job force, where the jobs are. We began to work with uh, different um, youth groups to create a bikeathon, varieties of rallies to create the energy and the juices flowing. And then we worked with uh, Harvard Divinity School to get pastoral students to work with them in their churches or uh, wherever they are, synagogues. We worked with many, many. Speaking of that, I think I, think I got a question that, yeah. that you might not have ever been asked before. Sure. Did you, do you ever keep track of the statistics of recovery rates between different religions? Uh, the follow-up question is, which religion is best for addiction recovery? Well, we did not really go into that as much. Uh, the belief system, we did not dwell too deeply into that. Um, but we connected with d varieties of people are there in, attached to my office. Probably one of the few practices in Massachusetts or anywhere in the country with a body of pastors and uh, you know, uh, uh, weird Buddhist people there, yoga, yoga people there. It's a touch base type thing. Whatever people like, we made them drink from many wells. Whatever they like, they, they took to it. 
Uh, so there wasn't any obvious differentiation as long as someone had some connection to to whatever spiritual community that they, they that they connected with it had the same effect pretty much exactly exactly some of them um, um, my you know patients black patients became um, they loved Tai Chi they they, we, we, they they loved somehow they gave up all, everything else and they became a Buddhist in a way um, so did my Jewish patients they took to Buddhism uh, some of my Christian patients, I think uh, they persisted in their religion, in their faith. They had some bad experiences in the past, so, well, we worked with the best we could uh, with the groups because it's sensitive areas of, uh, you know, human life. Um, and people had changes in their uh, perceptions from time to time. So we lived with it, uh, whatever their method of operation, but we created uh, a non-denominational approach to the spiritual aspects uh, by bringing students into the system. So with this, we enhance, the, it's called the sobriety enhancement phase. So now they have a rich body of uh, uh, life, rich corpus of uh, ideas, thoughts. And then they, use, like a mechano said, they used it to make a life for themselves, a heuristic understanding of the world around them. They have a better sense of how to stay sober, it happened organically. We didn't do much. We just, uh, like English butlers watching this, the show go on. Uh, but it happened very organically. We created the nurturing environment. So w once we began to enhance the sobriety experience, some of them didn't want to leave us for primary care. So they stayed with us in primary care system. So it gave us another extra chance to follow them through their life cycle, and through different things, because life, Life is full of pain, and pain and addiction are flip sides of the coin. Uh, when they are, when they got a lot of free time on hand, many of them took to extreme sports like uh, bungee jumping or uh, mountain climbing, hiking. Because it's an adrenaline addiction. Exactly, and then that comes. I, I'm, I'm familiar. I wrecked four mo motorcycles when I got back from Iraq. Yeah. I, w I was addicted to wrecking motorcycles. <laughs> They go full blast, you know, which is what we got to, we got to break them a little bit. It's sometimes hard. They got to crash once or twice before they come back or they just twist their ankle. Then they come back saying, look, I don't want to take any pain medicines. So we figured out non-addictive pain treatments like Toradol shots and various of chiropractic techniques. We had a chiropractor. Any, anything with cannabis or kratom? Uh, not at their stage. Because this was earlier on, because what, what, now, now just so, so everybody's clear in the timeline, uh, you were working in the jail system from 77 to 89, and was that when you started then setting off on your own? And then you had, you, you built this business up to 52 centers throughout Massachusetts, and then you started... Well, you, you guys have seen where this story is going, right? You don't get to challenge the establishment this effectively without some kind of pushback unless, and, and, and this is why I'm really excited about this interview right now, it, it, unless you can make it an obvious national thing. And, and the pushback on you is starting to come in 2001. And remember, even back in 2001, the internet as we know it today wasn't nearly as vibrant as it is today. This kind of pioneering work in addiction treatment doesn't get to just, oh, they have cure rates that are, tr that are a scale higher than, than everything else. Let's, let's replicate that all over the country. In, in 2001, you could still, as the, the government or, or the, the you know, big pharma or the, the, the prison industrial complex, which is obviously intertwined with all of this, the legal system with all of the various profiteers of the drug war. And on top of that, the, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if you have a term for it, like a, a, a pharmaceutical industrial addiction complex or something like that, but there is yeah. around addiction treatment with methadone clinics, especially with jail systems, with all the other government programs. There are huge number of people who are dependent on graft from this system, just straight up hurting people, compromising their treatment in order to profit. And obviously what Dr. Kishore is talking about here is a huge challenge to all of that. So 
your legal challenges, your pushback from this started. Yeah. Before we get to is there anything else you want people to know about the setup, like leading up to, to 2001, the start of your, your legal case? Uh, actually, um, 2001, people were still laughing at me, but uh, in, in Blue Cross Blue Shield suddenly realized that they got an epidemic on hand, so they gave me a statewide contract in 2001 that actually pushed more wind into my sales. I became the gatekeeper for 2.4 million uh, Blue Cross members in the state, where we have 6 million people. But the pushback began to come in uh, 2006. Uh, 2004, the Celtics honored me, saying, you're a hero, we like you. And they brought me to the center court and gave me a big award. Uh, all that was going good in 2004, five. The pushback started in 2006, when I wrote an op-ed in the Boston Herald saying uh, giving uh, suboxone to the, the young children is like giving you know, candy in a way. That's how the, the, the newspaper writer wrote it. And all hell broke, broke loose at that time. So hold on, you gotta explain, guys, what is suboxone and what was the issue with, with it being uh, given to kids here in Massachusetts? Right, and methadone, can, methadone is um, the first drug that out of the gate for addiction treatment, opioid addiction treatment. And um, the second drug that came out in 2001 is Suboxone. Um, and it was for younger people also. So they were getting given that at ages 16, 17, 18. And I felt it is kind of not right. Uh, and I wrote an op-ed piece or I, I helped a, a newspaper reporter write a story. And then people from Washington everywhere began to come to my office and you slandered our drug and uh, you have to retract your statement. Look, I'm standing by my statement, the other data. You slandered our drug, that's just, yeah, yeah, our sacred cash cow. Our intellectual property, no less. Yeah, and this is how the um, first um, shot was across my bow. And then in 2007, um, <clears throat> they began to investigate my sober house contracts, nothing happened there. In 2009, you you almost did it, but yeah, investigate yeah. might be better expressed as find a way to mess with you, right? That's right. I mean, it's not it's not like an honest. There's there's no crime. There's no victim. You're yeah. treating patients. Everybody's happy. There are no complaints. To call it an investigation is is a typical perversion of the American legal system. Exactly right. And unfortunately for me, the the nothing happened. They they hired outside co contractors. And that was closed. And uh, in 2009, they did a sting operation. They brought in um, me to a sober house and said, okay, we want your services, but they wanted me to say something on record, I guess. Luckily for me, I was with my whole team. We had a car full of people who went there. And so that was a miserable bust. They didn't get the information they wanted. Don't talk to cops. <laughs> So in 2009, I didn't even know, it's, it's just before Christmas, and we went there to see the program and see how best we can help them with uh, primary care. And the next time uh, something happened was in 2010, November, they sent the DEA after me. All the agencies, federal agencies were after me now. The DEA came in, they, they checked all my books, and they didn't find a single opiate prescription anywhere. So they're left with a dry well. They didn't find anything to accuse me of. Uh, the, the woman who came in from uh, the DEA said, never seen an addiction practice with no narcotics. <laughs> <laughs> so she spent three weeks in my office, you know, watching our every move, looking at records, and she left. And then they brought in the OIG, Office of Inspector General, to kick the tires. We spent... Uh, umpteen hours copying everything from telegrams to emails to contracts to my childhood photos, everything they wanted. So we gave them like uh, 100 disks of uh, material, 500,000 pages. So nothing happened with that. So then in January of 2011, I get a message from my lawyer saying that um, I should plead guilty pre-indictment. They won't indict you if you plead guilty. This is the deal they want to give me. I said, what am I pleading guilty to? Oh, they'll write it all up, just sign the piece of paper. I said, no, I'm not going to do that, you, you are out of the door. So we got rid of that lawyer, got another one. And this is how the pressure starts, you know, pre-indictment guilty pleas. 
uh, we want to, you know, appoint a, a monitor for your practice. They wanted to appoint a monitor so that they'll take over the reins of power. I'll become a sideshow. Uh, and then, of course, they can do whatever they want once they have the, you know, monitoring. That, that would be a monitor for financial control, right? Yeah. Which means they can uh, merge or acquire the properties and, and uh, you know, sort of um, disburse the monies. They have full control on my f corporate affairs. So I refused that. Um, then the acts fell. They, they came after me like gangbusters on September 20th, uh, 2011, with uh, 20 state police troopers, 13 Brookline troopers, <laughs> helicopters, and gunships. And <laughs> it's like a living inside a Kafkaesque movie. So, like, so I, I, this this happened to me too. Like I, I was raided for for civil disobedience. It's a little different because there was actually a shotgun involved. They they had sort of an excuse to go after one guy with a shotgun. But I used to brag like they sent more men after me than Osama bin Laden. And then after a while, I was like. That's happened to a lot of people in this country. <laughs> like it, 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 in a case like this, it's just right. the government sent more men after a doctor treating patients peacefully with all of the patients happy. I mean, as happy as you can be in those circles, happy with the treatment. And they sent more men after him than Osama bin Laden. Like saying. Same thing. They, they got to they got to justify these ridiculous budgets. They got the militarization of police. Is just another vector of corruption on a case like this? So I think uh, they hauled me off to the Medford Police Barracks, tied me up in the to the bed. So the next morning they produced me. I had a, a shadow on my face. You know, I didn't shave. I had to go in and uh, in front of a bank of cameras and <laughs> reporters. <laughs> It's uh, just like you see in the you know big movies. Another good reason to grow a beard. <laughs> they will never make you look like you didn't shave before going to court the next week. You always look like you're supposed to. <laughs> Sorry. So, this fashion sidebar brought to you by now. Stop there. So, and then they want to put me away for pre, uh, pre, they wanted a huge bail, a million and a half dollars. <clears throat> and uh, they want to put me away for, uh, I was unable to raise the money because all my properties are frozen by this commercial lab. I couldn't dissolve, even though I had wealth. All my accounts were frozen. It's all very well planned. And uh, they expected I'll stay in the pretrial, uh, you know, pretrial detention for a bunch of months or years and come out all haggard and beaten up. But luckily for me... Hold on. What was their gra so? What was their grounds of setting the bail so high and just denying, like denying you, just pretrial release of some kind of whether it's, I don't know what the system here is in Massachusetts if it's bail or bond or whatever. But I'm pretty sure everywhere in the United States, if they're going to hold you or put an excessive bond like that, that they have to say that you're a flight risk or you're a, a threat to the community. What the fuck were they trying to say about you? To say you're a threat to the community. Yeah. And uh, I'll start my practice or I'll flee. You know, both of them, they, they used against uh, me. Well, you might go back to India or something yeah, to right. avoid all that. That's right. And um, yeah, they took my passport anyway, but uh, they still wanted a million and a half dollar bail. They re reduced it to about uh, 150 or 200, but still there's a lot of cash bail. Uh, addiction, I call it a happy disease. It's, I loved working with the addicted community. They're young people, uh, the prime of life, backbone of the country. If they get better, they're not only better, they embraced life with both their hands. Many of them went to law schools, engineering schools. I uh, love the way that they you know, seize their life and pr progress ahead. So I don't like the uh, depressing aspect saying we need to do harm reduction. I'll say, why don't you do harm avoidance? We can teach them harm avoidance techniques, like we do with defensive driving in car, uh, you know, we drive for the driver's license. So we have techniques, we developed a lot of techniques that are very useful for these young fellas. We connected all the dots for them, so they did very well. The families were happy. We avoided a lot of uh, mortality and morbidity as a result of a practice. So it can be done. It can be done by others. If people want information, they can contact me at 617-953-8994 or um, <clears throat> through my email, psk at pmai.net. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much, Doctor. I wish you the best of luck, and I really hope this message gets out. A lot of people need Adam to see this. Adam vs. The Man is made possible with support from SmartCash. Check out smartcash.cc to find out more about this powerful, business-focused cryptocurrency that is fast, easy to use, and community-centric. SmartCash is designed to be securely used for day-to-day -day transactions and put the currency back in cryptocurrency.